The bosses that came up the outfit ladder in the 1930s grew up during a very tough time in the country's history. This made them an especially brutal breed of men. In 1966, Paul Rica put the brakes on, leaving Accardo to make more of the high-level decisions. He decided Giancana was out and inserted Salvatore Sam Battaglia as the front man. Battaglia was acting boss from 1966 to 1967. His term was short, only one year at the helm. Battaglia's street name was Joe Rock. He joined the outfit under bosses Johnny Torrio and Al Capone at the start of the gang war against the Irish Northside Gang. Battaglia had an extensive criminal record that included over 12 arrests for burglary, robbery, and murder. He was the prime suspect in seven homicides. When Battaglia testified before the Senate Subcommittee on Investigations on Organized Crime, Battaglia invoked the Fifth Amendment over 60 times. Battaglia was convicted in 1967 of violating the Hobbs Act for obstructing interstate commerce and was sentenced to 15 years in prison. On September 7, 1973, Salvatore Tietz Battaglia died at his home. He was 64 years old. Battaglia was laid to rest at Queen of Heaven Cemetery in Hillside, Illinois. Felix Anthony Milwaukee Phil Aldericio was acting boss from 1967 to 1971. He was the underboss to Sam Giancana during the 1960s. Phil Aldericio with partner outfit trigger man Charles Nicoletti carried out murders in the outfit Hitmobile. It was specially designed to evade and deceive cops, and it had many hidden compartments full of all kind of guns. Years later, FBI investigators learned that in May of 1962, these two guys and Tony Spilatro took part in the torture murder of Billy McCarthy. They tortured him for days, and a few days later they grabbed Jimmy Maraglia and killed him too. McCarthy had a beef days before with the Scalvo brothers, and later he went back with Jimmy Maraglia and caught them leaving the bar with a waitress. They chased them in their car, and the brothers crashed. And they got out and gunned them down. All three were killed, both brothers and the waitress. McCarthy and Maraglia were killed on orders from Ricardo and Rica for gunning down the Scalvo brothers. The brothers owned a bar called the Black Door and it was under Ricardo and Rica's protection. The murder and torture of Billy McCarthy was made famous in the head in the vice scene in the film Casino. It was Milwaukee Phil Aldericio that turned the handle on the vice that Billy McCarthy's head was in, while Spilatro and Charles Nicoletti held him down. In Chicago, the killing of McCarthy and Maraglia is known as the M&M murders. Aldericio was suspected in carrying out 13 to 14 hits for the outfit since joining the Capone mob in the 1930s. Milwaukee Phil Aldericio has a huge arrest record. He was arrested 36 times for assault, battery, racketeering, loan sharking, illegal gambling, hijacking, narcotics, counterfeiting, bootlegging, bribery, extortion, and murder for hire. And he held the reins of the outfit for four years. Then he was convicted of extortion and sent to prison. On September 25, 1971, Felix Aldericio died at age 59 from natural causes at the United States Penitentiary in Marion, Illinois. He was laid to rest at Queen of Heaven Cemetery in Hillside, Illinois. This tactic by Rica and Accardo of putting front men like Nitti, Giancana, Battaglia, and Aldericio 
help them to stay in the shadows and avoid prison time. In 1972, poor health and age caught up with Paul Rica, and he passed away at age 74. Rica was older than Ocardo, and there was a nine-year age difference between them. In the early years, Rica was a big brother type mentor to Ocardo. Rica was the quiet brains of the outfit, and for over 40 years, he learned from his mistakes and others' mistakes and he adapted and evolved with the times. Throughout Rika's career, he was convicted of murder in 1917, extortion in 1943, and tax evasion in 1959. Rika held the actual power in the outfit, and in the early days, Rika frequently overruled Nitty's orders by saying, we'll do it this way, now let's hear no more about it. In 1932, the leaders of the emerging New York syndicate came to Chicago for direct talks with Rica. New York top boss Lucky Luciano only dealt with Rica, not Nitty. In April of that year, Luciano and Meyer Lansky came to Chicago for a face-to-face -face meeting with Rica. After that meeting, Rica a Capone cousin and the New York faction were arrested by the Chicago police outside the Congress Hotel. This photo of their arrest is proof of the power Rika had. They came all the way from New York to deal directly with him. In 1958, Rika was named by a Senate Crime Investigating Committee as the country's most important criminal. And he was. Decades of outfit secrets died with Rika. Throughout Rika's life, he was constantly being investigated by the U.S. Senate, the FBI, and local cops until the day he died. One has to ask, was it worth it? He was interred in a mausoleum at Queen of Heaven Cemetery in Hillside, Illinois. Tony Accardo now held the reins of the outfit, and there was nobody alive to oppose his rule. And just like that, he became the boss of bosses here in Chicago, and he reigned with an iron fist. During Sam Giancana's nine years in Mexico, Accardo made a couple of moves. The first move was getting rid of Rica protege, Sam Stefano. Mad Sam was the juice loan king of Chicago, and at any given time, he had a million dollars out on the streets. His street name was Mad Sam for a reason. He was a stone-cold, sadistic killer. He basically abused everyone he dealt with, including his wife. Sam was not a made man, but did have a vicious crew behind him, and that gave him a lot of influence in the outfit. Sam was brought into the outfit while in Leavenworth Federal Penitentiary in the 1940s. He met outfit members Paul Rica and Louis Campagna. Sam did a couple of stints in prison and had a long criminal record, ranging from bootlegging, gambling, loan sharking, bank robbery, rape, and illegal possession of a firearm by a felon. In 1955, Sam Giancana ordered DiStefano to murder his younger brother Michael. Michael was an outfit enforcer. Sam did not hesitate to do the deed. Michael was shot multiple times. Sam avoided shooting him in the head. Then he cleaned Michael up, dressed him in a suit, and stuck him in the trunk. He was found immediately by cops. He was killed because he was doing heroin and the bosses didn't trust him not to talk if a problem arose. And they did not want drug addicts or rats in their ranks. If the outfit bosses had even a sliver of doubt about someone's loyalty, they acted immediately. And their motto was, better safe than sorry. In 1960, FBI agent Bill Romer asked Jackson to be an informant for the FBI. And being a loyal outfit member, Jackson did not go along with the feds. Nonetheless, in 1961, Jackson was accused of being a rat, 
and he was kidnapped by Sam and his crew and taken to a meatpacking plant on Chicago's south side. Sam and his crew were not taking a chance on this not being true, so they hung him on a meat hook and impaled him through his rectum and then burned him with an acetylene torch while hanging in the air and being questioned by Sam and his mob enforcers. It took Action Jackson three days to die. His body was found on August 12, 1961 in the trunk of his own car, which had been abandoned on Lower Wacker Drive. The killing is said to be the most violent torture murder in outfit history. According to crew member Chucky Cromaldi, Sam would say it was his dream in life to own a pig farm so he could feed his victims to the pigs. He even drove to pig farms just to watch them for hours. Over the years, Sam mentored the young Tony Spilatro. He showed Tony how to kill men with hammers, knives, shivs, guns, and even a blowtorch. His brutality was sadistically legendary throughout the outfit. The bosses decided Sam Stefano had to go and ordered Tony Spilatro and his brother Mario Stefano to do the deed, whack Sam. And on April 14, 1973, Mario and Tony pulled up to pick up Sam at his house. Mario got out first, and when Sam approached Mario, Tony Spilatro came from behind Mario with a shotgun and pumped multiple shots into Sam. The fatal shot was to his stomach, and Sam fell to the floor on his garage and died. The murder of Sam Stefano was ordered for a variety of reasons. He was a great earner for the outfit, but he was just too damn unpredictable and uncontrollable. But the worst thing was the show that he was putting on for the media. He took his insane case to the television, and this was a big mistake. The bosses didn't want media seeking attention hounds in their ranks. This is how much power the outfit bosses had over their own members. They told them to kill their own brothers, and they did this without hesitation. In 1975, Sam Giancana was killed for similar reasons. Accardo cleaned house after the death of Paul Rica, and those that didn't want to fall in line were killed, and there were other purge murders that followed the death of Paul Rica. Mad Sam Stefano's reign of terror was over, and he was buried at Queen of Heaven Cemetery in Hillside, Illinois. I find this ironic. Thirteen years later, Sam's killer would be laid to rest directly across from him, about 200 feet away. These are the men that ran the rackets over the decades in Chicago. Some of the rackets changed with the times, and others stayed the same. These men were involved in alcohol, drugs, prostitution, burglary, skimming, loan sharking, gambling, extortion, political corruption, and murder. Tony Accardo was a boss in the outfit from the 1940s until his death in 1992. He was a member of the outfit since the mid-1920s. And the story of the outfit after Capone is Accardo's story. And I can't tell Accardo's story without telling all the former bosses stories. After the loss of Salvatore Sam Battaglia in 67, and Felix Milwaukee Phil Aldericio in 71, Accardo Enrica inserted Joey Iupa as acting boss. This was business as usual. The front men never made decisions without the counsel of Rica and Accardo. And when Rica died in 1972, Accardo became the ultimate and final authority in the outfit. Joseph John Iupa, known as Joey O'Brien, and Joey Doves, sat at the helm from 1971 until 1986. 
His underboss was Jackie Cerrone, a.k.a. Jackie the Lackey. His rise started in the 1950s. He was a chauffeur to boss Tony Accardo and then became one of Giancana's feared enforcers. Over Cerrone's 50 years in the outfit, he was arrested over 20 times for armed robbery, bookmaking, embezzlement, and was suspected in multiple murders. Cerrone stayed by Ayupa's side until the end, when they were both convicted for skimming millions from Las Vegas casinos, and were sent to prison in 1986. In the 1920s, Joey Ayupa, a former boxer, joined the outfit under Torreon Capone and rose quickly through the ranks. He began his career as a driver for high-ranking outfit leaders and soon graduated to operating several gambling establishments in Cicero. The clubs had underground casinos, bookmakers, and prostitution. In the 1930s, Ayupa also had connections to the Dillinger Gang and the Carpus Gang. Chicago Crime Files show in 1935, Ayupa was a trigger man and bank robber for Claude Screwy Maddox. Claude Maddox was a teen member of the gang Egan's Rats from St. Louis. Egan's Rats were absorbed by the Capone outfit and Egan's Rats, just like the 42 Gang, also served as a recruitment arm for the outfit in the mid-1920s. Claude Maddox moved up and became the leader of the Circus Cafe Gang. The Circus Cafe was the only Northside Gang to ally with Capone. Some of the members include Anthony Tough Tony Capizio, Vincent DeMora, a.k.a. Machine Gun Jack McGurn, and Tony Big Tuna Accardo. Claude Screwy Maddox was alleged to have been one of the planners of the St. Valentine's Day Massacre. Tony Accardo immediately went to work tightening up the six street crews in Chicago. Tony Accardo was acting boss and shared power with frontman Joey Iupa. His daily advisors were Sam Carlisi, Jackie Cerrone, William Messino, Butch Blassie, Chucky English, Lenny Patrick, and Gussie Alex. These are the six Chicago capos and their underbosses. Northside crew capo Dominic DiBella, Underboss Vincent Solano, 26th Street Crew Capo Turk Torello, Underboss Angelo LaPetria, Cicero Crew Capo Joe Ferriola, Underboss Rocky Infelice, Elmwood Park Crew Capo John DeFranzio, Underboss Joe Andraki, Grand Avenue Crew Capo Joey Lombardo, underboss Louis Aboli, Chicago Heights crew capo Al Pilato, underboss Albert Taco, under Ricardo and acting boss Joey Iupa, the outfit moved forward, going through its most financially successful period under the only authority it had. Accardo. He focused more on traditional vices, like slot machines, vending machines, and counterfeiting cigarette and liquor tax stamps. And the big one was he expanded narcotics trafficking. Accardo placed slot machines in gas stations, restaurants, and bars. But his biggest venture was taking the outfit out of Chicago and expanding operations in Las Vegas. Accardo even took influence over gaming away from the five families of New York. And he made sure that all the legal Las Vegas casinos used his slot machines. Accardo phased out some traditional organized crime activities, such as labor racketeering and extortion. 
He even converted the outfit's brothel business into a call girl service. And he did some old time bootlegging on the west coast. But what he changed was the chain of command. When he issued orders, his orders went through three or four different buffers before going to the source. And this helped protect him from the feds for the next 20 years. The one thing that never seemed to slow down or stop in the outfit were the murders. In the 1970s, two especially violent hitmen would emerge from within two of the six outfit crews. The first one is Tony the Ant Spilatro. Spilatro was part of the Grand Avenue crew, and his boss was Joey Lombardo. Spilatro was suspected of carrying out 25 murders in Chicago and Nevada from the late 1960s until 1986. And the second is Harry the Hook Ailman. Ailman was part of the Cicero crew. And his uncle was his boss, Joe Ferriola. In 1971, the Chicago outfit created a crack hit crew called the Wild Bunch. This group of hitters was made up of half a dozen killers that were led by Harry Ailman. And their job was to carry out the outfit's most difficult and urgent hits. They carried out 31 murders from 1971 to 1981. Ailman was suspected in personally carrying out 16 murders in Chicago and one in Kansas City from 1971 to 1977. One of Ailman's victims was involved with a family member of mine. His name, Ronnie Magliano. Magliano was an outfit fence. On May 12, 1975, Harry Ailman and two of his Wild Bunch killers went to his house on 63rd and Kilpatrick, and he willingly let Ailman and his guys in the fortified house he lived in. Then they tied him up, blindfolded him, beat him, tortured him with acid, then Ailman shot him in the head and set his house on fire. Had my relative been over at his house that day, they would have killed her too because the outfit never leaves witnesses. And she was lucky, very lucky. Picardo had a big problem arise in 1977 when a rogue outfit connected burglary crew robbed his suburban mansion. He ordered 10 murders that were tied to the break-in and within days bodies began to pile up. This all started when a friend of Accardo's jewelry store got robbed. Accardo met with the jewelry store owner, Harry Levinson. He was an outfit bookie and friend of Accardo's, and his store was under the protection of the outfit. Accardo told Levinson during the meeting he would get to the bottom of it, and Accardo later met with two of his top guys, Jackie Cerrone and Gus Alex, and gave them the job to find out who did this. So they contacted Tony Spilatro in Vegas. Spilatro had major knowledge of the burglary crews operating in the Chicagoland area. And he immediately said, check out the Mendel crew. It sounds like their handiwork. This info by Spilatro led Cerrone and Alex to the fence. And they put pressure on him to return the merchandise from the jewelry store heist. Cerrone and Alex got it back and returned it to owner Harry Levinson. When burglary crew leader John Mendel found out the merchandise was returned, he was really pissed off and decided to rob Accardo's house and get it back. They thought the loot was still in Accardo's house, but it wasn't, so they stole his money and personal things. On the night of January 5th, 1978, Mendel and his crew acted and they were able to bypass numerous security systems and break into Accardo's home. While Accardo's house was being robbed, he was vacationing in California. And when he came back, it was said by Iupa, I've never seen the old man this pissed off in all the years I've known him. The burglary crew Accardo was going to eliminate was headed by John Mendel. 
Mendel and five of his crew members were executed over a three-month span following the break-in. Also falling victim to Accardo's purge was his Sicilian-born residence caretaker, two hitmen that knew too much about the Godfather's vengeful murder spree, and one wise guy who simply happened to be in the wrong place at the wrong time. Mendel had the reputation as the most skilled bypass man in the whole outfit, and he was the first to go. Disappearing on January 15th, he was later found in the trunk of his car, stabbed and strangled to death. The little guy reputed hitman Ronnie Jarrett brought Mendel to a garage where he was killed by the Calabrese brothers. Frank strangled Mendel, and Nick cut his throat. On January 20th, his second in charge, Bernard Buddy Ryan, was discovered dead behind the wheel of his car with four bullet holes to the back of his head. And burglar Steve Garcia made it until February 2nd. He popped up in the trunk of a car at the Sheridan Hotel next to O'Hare International Airport. On February 4th, burglar and fence Vincent Moretti and his buddy Don Reno were murdered in a Cicero restaurant at Cermak and Laramie. They were both brutally beaten and their throats were slashed. The double homicide came to be referred to as the Strangers in the Night Murders because the Johnny Mathis song was playing on the jukebox as Moretti and Reno were beaten, stomped, and tortured by an outfit hit team. This was the hit team assembled to carry out the murders. Nick Calabrese, Frank Calabrese, Tony Borsellino, Joe Ferriola, Butch Petroselli, Frank Saldino, Johnny Monteleone, Ronnie Jarrett, and Jimmy LaPetria manned the police scanner in the car. Moretti, a former police officer, had been seen wearing Ricardo's gold cufflings around town days before he was killed. When the job was complete, Ronnie Jarrett drove the car to the dump spot in Stickney Township. Both men were found dead in the back seat of Moretti's Cadillac convertible. It was a grisly scene, to say the least. On April 6th, the last two members of Mendel's crew were dealt with. Bobby Hertogs was found in the trunk of his car. He had been badly beaten and his throat was slit. And on April 14th, Johnny McDonald was found lying dead in a west side alley, shot in the back of the head, and his throat was slit. And on October 5th, Accardo's caretaker, native Sicilian Mike Volt, vanished weeks after testifying in front of a grand jury investigating the murders linked to the January break-in. His body has never been found. In order to cover his tracks, Accardo cut ties from the purge he set in motion, and for whatever reason, turned his wrath towards two of the executioners he had sent out. On May 22nd, outfit lieutenant and hitman, Anthony Little Tony Borsellino, was found in a Will County cornfield, shot in the back of the head. Borsellino was part of the infamous Wild Bunch, a West Side troop of assassins dispatched on the Chicago mobs most pressing murder assignments. And on September 18th, the final murder took place. Outfit Lieutenant and Hitman, Gerald Jerry the Dinger Carasulo, was shot in the back of the head and left in an apartment complex in Addison. Carasulo was a driver and bodyguard for acting boss Joe Iupa. They were both shot and killed, most likely because they became unstable or knew way too much. But the 26th Street crew killers, Frank and Nick Calabrese, were spared. Go figure. 26 years later, Frank Calabrese Sr. would be convicted of three of the 10 murders. John Mendel, Donald Reno, and Vincent Moretti. And the men that committed the other murders were killed. This burglary crew way underestimated the power that Accardo still had in his old age. And order through murder had been restored by Tony Accardo.
I am from Bridgeport on the south side of Chicago. The Bridgeport neighborhood is home to the 26th Street Chinatown crew. It used to be headed by Angelo the Hook LaPetria, his brother, Shorty Lamantia, and many others. My father, Vic the Stick Maggio, used to take me with him everywhere when I was a young boy, about five years old, as I remember being taken to the racetrack, to the club, the Italian American club. And he introduced me to the outfit. But it was my grandfather, Joe Maggio. Now my grandfather was a master carpenter, a craftsman. Very unique individual, everything he did was custom. Staircases, bars, you name it. Anything with wood, this man did. And my grandfather used to take me with him when I was off school in the summer. I stayed with him most of the summer. And he took me in to a lot of the outfit guys' homes. Now they didn't trust anybody. So to let people into their home was a big thing. And they let my grandfather in and he was sought after by them because he was the best at what he did. But he kept his mouth shut. That was key. You see, he used to do specific things for the outfit. He used to build hiding places in their homes within the woodwork he built. One day, we were at the shop. I was about eight years old. And a couple outfit guys came in to get him. And they took him in a car. I didn't see him again for about a month because they took him to Tony Accardo's house to do a job. And he did that job for a month. And I was not invited to go. You don't go to Tony Accardo's house unless you're invited. Another bloody chapter in outfit history was the Chop Shop War. The war started in 1971 and ended in 1983. It was an internal war within the Chicago Heights crew. After 12 years of war, nearly three dozen were murdered, and in the end, only one man would be left standing. This was the leadership of the outfit during the war. The first involvement by the outfit in the stolen parts racket started with Albert Caesar Taco and James Jimmy the Bomber Katura. Independent of each other, they organized car thieves, auto body shops, parts stores, and salvage yards. By 1978, a multi-million dollar year racket was created, and at the height of the chop shop wars, over 40,000 cars a year were being stolen across the Chicagoland area and about 25,000 were being stolen by outfit associates. The parts were stripped and sold on the black market and Chicago had become the car theft capital of the country. The outfit leadership, mainly acting boss Tony Accardo, wanted to pull control of the stolen parts rackets away from independent operators and wanted to consolidate the racket for themselves. So they levied a tax on all involved in the chop shop rackets. Some of the operators made deals with outfit guys and in the end got squeezed out. And some didn't want to pay and were killed. Unfortunately, this is what set the stage for the murders of many outfit guys and their associates. And eventually, they turned their guns on each other. James Jimmy the Bomber Katura, also known as the Owl, had a crew that consisted of Italian and non-Italian members. And it was a very vicious crew with a feared reputation. Katura kept a ruthless bunch of enforcers around him. His number one was William Billy the Chopper Dauber. He was a feared hitman and enforcer. 
and his number two, Sam Sammy the Mule Anarino, was also a feared hitman and enforcer, along with Steve Otrowski, another Keturah hitman. The group moved in on Taco's territory, and this started the war between the two Chicago Heights factions. Many independent operators were caught in the middle of this war, and over the years, hitmen were brought in from other outfit crews to complete the takeover. Al Capone old-timer James the Bomber Katura got his street name from blowing up cabs in the Chicago taxi wars in the late 1920s and early 1930s. He became a member of the Chicago Heights crew, and his mentor was James Bel Castro, a.k.a. King of the Bombers. He headed his own bomb squad for the Capone outfit. In 1933, Katura was arrested for carrying a dynamite bomb. He was convicted and did eight years in Joliet State Prison and was paroled in 1942. After his prison term, he became a big earner for the outfit bosses. First was Frank Laporte and later Al Palato during the mid-1960s. Katura's new responsibility was to oversee the outfit's chop shop operations. Before the chop shop racket was established, Tony Accardo and Paul Rica decided to merge the men running territories in Cal City and Northwest Indiana into the Chicago Heights crew under longtime boss Frank Laporte. Some claim this move by the bosses is what led to an internal struggle within the Chicago Heights crew and eventually led to the Chop Shop Wars. Katoras and Tacos crews independently organized their own pieces of the Chop Shop racket. In 1963, Albert Taco was convicted and sent to prison for three years. After this, Katura took over the Chop Shop racket. His crew was also running loan sharking and many gambling operations across the city. And these rackets combined made Katura's crew one of the outfit's top earning crews and money machines of that time. Chicago Heights capo Frank Laporte was close to Al Capone and was one of the most powerful capos to sit on the ruling council. He was a low-key operator and very little is known or has been written about him and his activities in the outfit. He quietly retired in the mid-1960s and died in 1972. And then Al Palato took the reins of the Chicago Heights crew. Katura's reign as street boss of the chop shop business lasted for three to four years until Taco's release in 1973. That's when the Chicago Chop Shop War's death toll ramped up. The war lasted until 1983, and during the chaos, there were around 30 plus murders connected to the Chop Shop Wars. During the war, many of Katura's crew members switched sides or got whacked. It's been said the war was solely Katura's fault because he made moves against other outfit guys' territories during the consolidation effort. In 1969, two outfit crews started aggressively forcing everyone involved to fall in line. The first chop shop takeover casualty was Harry the Cat Carson. He was blown up in a car bomb in 1969 and he was co-owner of South Chicago Auto Parts. On June 17, 1971, outfit associate and master car thief, Robert Bobby the Racer Pronger disappeared from a Southside diner. His body was never found. It was said they chopped up his body and disposed of it. On August 8, 1972, Outfit member Guido Weeds Fidanzi was gunned down in front of his Chicago Heights gas station. Fidanzi was a top enforcer in Katura's crew. 
On September 3, 1972, South Bend, Indiana chop shopper Mike Regan was shot to death and left on the side of a rural Indiana road. On September 12, 1972, South Bend, Indiana car dealer and chop shop operator Roger Croach was found in a northwest Indiana field days after his auto yard was raided by the Indiana State Police and the FBI. They found half a dozen stolen cars on his lot, and this was enough to kill Roger Croach. The outfit was not going to give him the opportunity to rat them out. For about two and a half years, things quieted down. Then on June 16, 1975, it started up again. Outfit associate Harry the Hat Holzer and his girlfriend Linda Turner were shot to death at their Michigan home. Holzer was the co-owner of South Chicago Auto Parts with associate Steve Stevio Otrowski and Harry the Cat Carson. Carson was killed six years earlier in a car bombing. On July 13, 1975, car thief and chop shopper Jesse Richardson was gunned down in Cicero for not paying the outfit street tax. On November 15, 1975, outfit associate Donnell Eldorado Donnie Crawford was killed execution style in a Southside parking lot. Crawford was black and had strong ties to the South and West Side street gangs and was dealing directly with members of the outfits, Chicago Heights crew, in the drug and car theft rackets. On December 21, 1975, outfit associate Jimmy Sugar Baby Small was killed by being thrown out of a third floor window of his apartment in Chicago Heights. Small was Crawford's right hand man. On October 5, 1976, outfit associate Steve Stevio Ostrowski was gunned down in the parking lot of his South Chicago auto parts shop. He was caught in the crossfire of a power struggle within the Outfit Chicago Heights crew. Ostrowski acted as Outfit Street Boss Jimmy the Bomber Katura's boots on the ground in the chop shop takeover. On March 4, 1977, Outfit Associate and Car Thief Pat Marizars was killed at an Outfit card game on the Windy City's west side. On June 13, 1977, Chicago Outfit Enforcer Richard Ritchie the Wrecker Ferraro disappeared. Ferraro owned statewide auto wrecking in Calumet City and often acted as Jimmy Couture's bodyguard and personal collector. He was Stevie O's replacement as Couture's point man in the Chop Shop takeover. His body has never been found. On June 15, 1977, Chicago Outfit Enforcer Joseph Grizzly Joe Theo was found dead in his car from a shotgun blast to the head. This happened less than 48 hours after Ferraro's disappearance. Theo and Ferraro were partners in the car theft ring and they also ran a sophisticated burglary racket. On July 7, 1977, outfit associate Earl Mississippi Slim Abercrombie was found shot to death in the trunk of his car at O'Hare Airport. Abercrombie was a car thief and a drug dealer. On July 25, 1977, Outfit soldier Sam Sammy the Mule Anarino was gunned down in Oak Lawn after leaving a furniture store. Anarino was a Katuro crew hitman and enforcer. On August 25, 1977, outfit mobster James Junkyard Jimmy Pelagi was found shot to death in the back of a van. He owned a Kankakee junkyard. He was forced out of the business by Taco's crew and shortly after was murdered. In 1978, Couture made a huge series of mistakes. 
His crew shot out Secretary of State's Northern Auto Investigating Unit, Lieutenant Vladimir Kovich's squad windows, then tampered with his brakes, then loosened a tie rod on his car, and then planted a very powerful pipe bomb on his back porch near a gas line. Lucky for him, the bomb didn't go off. He was investigating Katura's crew and was closing in on the VIN number switch operation. Three other investigators in the unit had their back windows of their squad shot out in front of their homes, and another investigator's car was set on fire by Katura's crew. These stupid moves by Katura outraged many outfit bosses, and this sealed his fate, and Katura would not live to see the end of the war he started. On July 28, 1978, Chicago Heights crew boss James Jimmy the Bomber Katura was murdered. The hit was sanctioned by the outfit's top bosses. The man they used to kill him was more vicious and was more feared than the entire Chicago Heights crew. He policed the six outfit crews for the bosses and kept everyone in line. Just the mention of his name struck fear into the hearts of outfit hitmen across the city. His name was Frank the German Schweiss. Schweiss murdered Jimmy Couture and others during the car wars. And he was the boss's ace in the hole. He did work for the Capos representing the six outfit street crews. When Schweiss was given a job by the bosses, he made sure the victim instantly became trunk music. The phrase trunk music goes back to Sam Giancana. It means two shots to the head and the body goes into the trunk. In 1978, Schweiss and another hitter whacked Katura. They shot him five times, twice in the head, once in the neck, and once in the face. And the final shot was to his back while he was trying to crawl away. And that was it for Jimmy the Bomber, Katura. Schweiss was so feared by the outfit rank and file that when they heard he was coming, they would leave. And if he was seen in their neighborhoods or around their homes, they knew death was coming for them. This is a story about the level of fear the German had on one mobster. In the late 1980s, Frank Schweiss was being held in the Federal Metropolitan Correctional Center in Chicago at the same time as Outfit Wild Bunch member turned federal informant Gerald Scarpelli. The official story is Scarpelli committed suicide. He must have seen the German in the day room and then decided to tie his own feet and hands and choke himself to death with a plastic bag in the shower. It is safe to say the German whacked Scarpelli behind bars, or he was so afraid he choked himself to death while his hands were tied. I guess we'll never know for sure if Schweiss whacked Scarpelli. Schweiss is responsible for dozens of murders. These are just a few of the high-profile murders he committed. In 1974, he murdered Daniel Seifert. In 1976, Johnny Roselli. In 1977, Charles Nicoletti. In 1983, Alan Dorfman. In 1985, Charles Chucky English. And there were many others. Frank the German Schweiss was an enforcer and was the reason the frail old outfit bosses could run things without worrying about ambitious underlings trying to take control from them. The FBI considered Schweiss to be the Babe Ruth of outfit hitmen here in Chicago. Due to poor health, Frank Schweiss escaped the fate that awaited the other outfit killers during the 2007 Family Secrets trial. He died a year after the trial ended in 2008 from complications from lung cancer and a brain tumor. And Frank the German Schweiss was by far the most prolific killer the outfit ever produced. 
On June 1st, 1979, Chicago Outfit Associate, Timothy, Timmy Keystone O'Brien, a salvage yard owner, was found shot to death in the trunk of his car in Blue Island. O'Brien was under indictment for his involvement in the stolen car ring. He went missing a short time later. It was said he was murdered by outfit Wild Bunch hitter, Gerald Hector Scarpelli. On May 24, 1980, Chicago Outfit Associate Robert Chick Kurowski was murdered. Kurowski was an outfit collector and chop shop owner in Northwest Indiana and belonged to the Chicago Heights crew. He was killed by an outfit sniper's bullet as he walked his horse in a pasture. On May 27, 1980, outfit associate El Demiro Eddie Coffey de Jesus operated out of Northwest Indiana and was Chick Kurowski's right hand man. He died from a barrage of shotgun fire in an East Chicago alley. De Jesus and Kurkowski were the top suspects in the Steve Otrowski hit three years prior. On July 2nd, 1980, outfit enforcer William Billy the Chopper Dauber, a top hitman and enforcer for the Keturah crew, and his wife Charlotte were gunned down in a hail of bullets in their car during a high-speed chase on a rural road in Will County. The Dobbers had just left a court hearing for a drug and gun case. They were killed by members of the notorious Wild Bunch hit team, dispatched by the outfit's Cicero crew. The imposing and psychopathic Dauber was the Chicago Heights crew's main muscle in the chop shop racket takeover. He was killed because the outfit felt he would cut a deal and their instincts were right. He was cooperating with the feds. In early July of 1981, Chicago Heights boss Al Palato was shot multiple times on the eighth hole of the Lincolnshire Country Club in Crete. He survived and shortly after went to prison and then retired. This paved the way for the new boss, Albert Caesar Taco. After the attempted assassination of Al Palato, the bosses, Accardo, Iupa, and Cerrone, sent in feared 26th Street crew boss, Angelo Lapetria, to take control of the Chicago Heights crew because of the war that was raging on. This brought a lot of heat and unwanted attention to the outfit's other operations. On July 23, 1981, outfit associate Charles Charlie Monday Monzak was beaten to death and stuffed into the trunk of his car on Schubert Avenue. He was a car thief and a drug dealer in the Chicago Heights crew. On August 7, 1981, Chicago Outfit Associate Anthony Legato was tortured and beaten to death and found in his car. Legato was a car thief and a drug dealer, and he was partnered with Charlie Monday in a number of different rackets, and they were headquartered out of Monday's Southside Chop Shop. On November 1, 1982, Outfit Associate Harry the Recycler Rosenblum was killed by a four-man hit team wearing Halloween masks inside his Hammond, Indiana auto parts business. On January 11, 1983, outfit associate Robert Pitsy Subatich was found shot to death in the trunk of his Lincoln Continental at O'Hare Airport. Subatich was a chop shop operator and a drug dealer he disappeared from his Calumet City residence two days before Christmas in 1982. The last murder of the Chicago Outfit Chop Shop War took place on March 2, 1983. Chicago Outfit Associate Michael the Monk Chorak was found shot to death behind the desk at his office at M&J Auto Wrecking. Shorak was an enforcer and car thief from Lansing. He belonged to the outfit's Grand Avenue crew. 
and once worked with Billy Dauber in lining up the rogue chop shop owners. Dauber also owned M&J Auto Wrecking at the time of his death. One of Dauber and Shorak's former underlings escaped from prison to murder Shorak over a beef related to Dauber. On March 3, 1983, the guns fell silent, and Albert Caesar Taco was the last man standing. Seven years later, Taco was sentenced to 200 years in prison for racketeering, conspiracy, extortion, and tax fraud. He died of a stroke on September 21, 2005, at Terre Haute Federal Prison in Indiana. After the Chop Shop Wars came to an end, bosses Tony Accardo, Joey Iupa, and Jackie Cerrone decided what remained of the Chicago Heights crew would be merged into the 26th Street Chinatown crew. Over the 12-year war, most of the leadership and their top earners and many of their associates were killed, leaving the once feared Chicago Heights crew a shell of its former powerful self and the chop shop racket was not ended by government. It was ultimately ended by advancing technology. Every gangster in Chicago had a nickname, and these are just a few. Big Jim Colosimo was known as Diamond Jim. Johnny Torrio, The Fox. Dean O'Banion, Gimpy. Al Capone, Scarface. George Moran, Bugs Moran. Frank Nitty, The Enforcer Nitty. Paul Rica, The Waiter. Tony Accardo, Joe Batters, and Big Tuna. Sam Giancana, Mooney Giancana. Mooney means crazy. Sam Battaglia, Joe Rock. Joey Iupa, Joey Doves. Jackie Cerrone, Jackie the Lackey. Angelo Lapetria, The Hook Lapetria. Joey Lombardo, Joey the Clown. Anthony Spilatro, The Ant. And then there is Sam DiStefano, AKA Mad Sam. Teddy Rowe, Robin Hood. Jake Guzik, Greasy Thumb Guzik. Jack McGurn, Machine Gun Jack McGurn. Sam Young, Policy Sam Young. John Mushmouth Johnson, who's known as the Black Gambling King of Chicago, and they just called him the King. John DeFranzio, No Knows DeFranzio. The next chapter covers the outfit's involvement in the labor rackets and covers the FBI's three wiretap investigations that uncovered the Las Vegas skim. Also covered are the murders of FBI witness Daniel Seifert and outfit banker Alan Dorfman, and also focuses on top hitman Tony Spilatro's early days on the west side and his introduction and association with the Chicago outfit. 